time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to
time of worship. And, and after today, Holy Week officially begins. And I hope that you will join us for all the special worship opportunities throughout this week. On Thursday evening at 7, we will celebrate the institution of communion as Jesus and his disciples shared the Last Supper. And we remember how he told us to continue to celebrate his supper often and remember him through that. I also invite you to join us at noon on Good Friday for a special Tenebrae service, a way of the cross service. And then in the evening, we will present Song of the Shadows at 7.30 p.m. at the Strongsville United Methodist Church. All of this is in your bulletin, so please take note of all the things that are coming up. And then, of course, I do hope that you will join us on Easter morning. For the sunrise service at 6.30, we have a potluck brunch. Um, for the Easter celebration at 10.30 or both, you can do both if you would like to. But I hope that you will celebrate with us. Join us for this and everything that we do. You're always welcome. Our final session of our Lenten Bible study concludes on Tuesday at 11 a.m. Thank you all for being flexible. But if you didn't jump in and you want to join us, I think you would probably um, really enjoy this um, study. It's very interesting. And we'll kind of just see how um, you feel about that. But Tuesday at 11 a.m., if you are interested in being a part of that. As I said, uh, there are many things happening in the life of our church. All these things are in our bulletin. You can find it on our website as well. But now I would like to invite our liturgists up so that we can pray together the words to our opening prayer. Please turn in your bulletin and pray with me the words to our opening prayer. Righteous God, you brought your Son, Jesus, into Jerusalem to show the people the radical grace of your love. Show us this grace and give us eyes to see your goodness. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our epistle reading this morning is from Philippians 2, 5-11. through This is the New Revised Standard Version. Let the same mind be in you that was with Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in the human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even on the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I know our little disciples are very excited for their Sunday school time, but I kind of want to borrow you guys for just a minute. Can you guys come and, come and sit up here in this front view for a second so we can have some time too? I always like my time with you guys too, so come down. Oh, sure. It's a great room to pew today. There's so many of you that make me comfortable since there's all kinds of stuff up here today. So did you guys have fun with waving your palm branches and saying Hosanna? Do you know what Hosanna means? Who knows what it means? What can you guess? Peace? It means save us, right? So all the people who were shouting Hosanna, they wanted Jesus to save them. Now the people who were shouting that have been following Jesus, and they knew all about him because they've been listening to him, they've been learning from him. But then, all these people in the city of Jerusalem were like, what in the world is going on? Who is this guy? Who is this Jesus? Right? Who is this that you're all celebrating and waving palms for? Now, have you ever thought about that? Who is Jesus? What would you say if someone said, who is Jesus? Who's he? What would you say? What would you say? He's God of the world. Yes, very good. What else would you say about Jesus? What would you say? Yeah, he's our father. What else would you say about Jesus? Does he love you? Does he love everybody? Yeah, what else would you say about Jesus? Yeah. He's the light of the world. Oh my goodness. We could not run out of things to say about Jesus, right? And it's interesting because each of us will say different things about Jesus based on how we know 
know Jesus, right? If I had to describe Kyle, right, I would say, well, Kyle likes sports, and Kyle wears glasses, and Kyle likes to keep his hair short, but if Danielle were to describe Kyle, she might say some different things, right? Because she knows Kyle differently than I do. And you might describe Kyle differently, and you might describe Kyle differently too, right? And just like that, because of how we know Jesus, because of the way we've experienced Jesus in our life, we all answer that question just a little differently. But I think it's important for us to answer that question, answer it from our hearts, because Jesus is so important to share with everybody. Okay? Let us pray, and then I want you to go to your amazing Sunday School program. I know Mrs. R has wonderful things planned for you today, so let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you came to save us. We don't even have to ask. You did it anyway. Help us to really know you so that we can share you with everyone we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, go meet Mrs. R. She's showing for you in the back, okay? Let our hosannas to the one who brings liberation take form in our tithes and offerings. Will the ushers please come forward?
celebratory prayer that is found in your bulletin with me. God of all the gifts, we thank you for showing us how to care for each other. May these gifts bear the fruits of justice and plenty, of peace and wholeness in the world. Give us grateful hearts, O oh God, in the name of the one who came to draw all people to himself, Jesus Christ our Savior. Lord Jesus, you came to us humbly, riding a donkey and proclaiming a message of peace. You are God, and yet you chose to take on our human life to bring us life at the ultimate cost. And so, Lord of all, we do bow down at your name, and our tongues confess that you are indeed our Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Thank you that we can come to you to lift our prayers to you, that you pray for us, and that you continue to save us still. We pray this day that Christians everywhere may hear and share the word of God as true disciples, with all who need to hear this good news, who need to hear that they are loved and saved in your name. We pray that all the ends of the earth will receive the words of the King of Peace. We pray for the leaders of church and of state, that they may imitate you in preferring humble service to empty power for the sake of the people they are called to serve and lead. We pray, Lord, that all people will live in gratitude for the gifts of nourishment, friendship, family, trust, patience, and hope, with the courage and the wisdom to change whatever fails to be life-giving to their neighbors. 
We pray, Lord Jesus, that those who see the cross starkly revealed in their lives will draw strength from your name that is above every other name. Hear their cries, O Lord, and deliver them from all that grieves their hearts and souls. We pray, O God, that we might live with gratitude for our ancestors whose faith and witness have nourished our own, that all who mourn today will be comforted, and that we, who hope to greet Jesus when he comes again, will be ready and filled with joy. God, our Creator, you show your sons and daughters the way to freedom through the gentle obedience of your Son, Jesus Christ. Make us to be more like him every day. Hear us now, O Lord, as we pray boldly together the prayer that our Lord Jesus first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, and we will be reading from chapter 21, verses 1 through 17. This is the New Revised Standard Version. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did, and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourselves. Jesus left them, went out of the city to Bethany, and spent the night there. The story of God for the covenant people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Let your word, O God, break open our hearts this day through the power of the Holy Spirit that we may enter into the coming Holy Week with the same mind that was in Jesus Christ. May your word come through me or in spite of me. Amen. <laughs> now I've already kind of given this away, right? Because you know me, I love a good celebration. But I love these joy-filled Palm Sunday celebrations that we have. It's always so beautiful and joy-filled and spontaneous. And I love seeing everyone's palm branches in the air. I love 
was playing in my drum branch too as we sing Hosanna. That's something kind of neat. I love that song too, Hosanna, La Hosanna. Just as the little children were shouting in the temple, it kind of reminds me of that, and I think it's kind of based on that. This is what the people were shouting to Jesus as, he, as they kind of accompanied and, and welcomed and ushered him into the city of Jerusalem. Now, our perception's always a bit chaotic, and, and therefore perhaps not unlike the very first Palm Sunday that we just read about in the Gospel, as Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem, and this is always neat. Matthew is the only one, let me just make sure this is on, yeah. Matthew is the only one who actually has Jesus not just riding on a donkey, but on both a donkey and a colt. Now that's a trick, friends, I don't know how we do that, but, but this is all very important because of the scripture of the prophet that said Jesus will ride a donkey, the colt of a donkey. So for Matthew, it's important to say, this is indeed your Messiah. Look, he did exactly what the prophet said he would do. But now, as you can imagine, all this loud shouting, all this hullabaloo, right? The singing and the joy of the crowds who accompanied Jesus into the city soon attract the attention of the inhabitants of the city, the people of Jerusalem. Now, we're told that the whole city is in turmoil. And I can imagine why, because it is the beginning of the Feast of Passover. Now, Jerusalem normally was you know, a bigger city, it had about 25,000 people, but that would swell to impossible numbers during the high holy days, the festival days, when people traveled from all over the known world, Jewish people from even outside of Palestine would come to the temple for these festival days because it was important to come and offer your sacrifices to the Lord, to be with your community, to celebrate these things, to you know, have an opportunity to um, make your contribution to the temple that is required, your tithe, and so forth. So the city would be more crowded than usual, and, and this kind of chaos and this weird stuff going on at this back gate of the city is kind of concerning, because the Romans are always watching when there's a large number of people gathered, and you don't want to be having them misunderstand what is going on. So just, just what are you people doing back here? What, what is all this? Who is this guy, they ask? And they reply, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now we know Jesus is so much more than a prophet. He's not simply just the one who speaks for God as the prophets of old were. He's, he's a prophet like Elijah who can work beautiful and healing miracles. He's a prophet like Moses who leads the people and who helps them to understand who God is and what God is about to to help them to learn God's will and God's way. He's a prophet like <coughs> Daniel, who casts beautiful visions of what the world could look like if the kingdom of heaven reigned in every human heart. Visions of wholeness and peace and flourishing and thriving for all people everywhere. And so much more. He is more than even this. He is the Messiah, the Son of David. He is the one who was sent by God to save God's people. Now all of these people who have been following Jesus, they've come to him from all different walks of life, all different places. As they were moving from Galilee to Jerusalem, more and more people kind of added on to the crowd, to the multitude, right? So I'm sure that, you know, people just came for all sorts of reasons. And when they were asked the question, right, who is this? I think Matthew's response is sort of a summary of what all these people might have said. Matthew summarizes it as Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. But if we hear their question, who is this? I can imagine people would have said a variety of different things, like, he's the one who healed me from leprosy. He's the one who restored my sight. He's the reason I can walk today. He told me that I am forgiven and loved by God. He does not throw me away like everyone else does. But he sees me. He knows me. He loves me. He says that I belong, that I am a child of God. He is God with a face, a God we can see and touch and sit by and listen to. And I know that it's like I did with the kids. If I were to ask you all who Jesus is, I 
think your answers would be just as varied. Because who Jesus is to us is based largely on how we have experienced the love of Jesus Christ, the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. Now Jesus makes his way to the temple, where he immediately sets about driving out the vendors and the money changers, turning over tables and chairs. Now you can just imagine. Now if people were concerned about the, the procession, that was the calm part, right? Because now there are coins rolling everywhere. There are, you've seen what happens to birds when they're frightened. The doves are probably like flapping and there's feathers flying everywhere and the, the cattle and the sheep that are there for the other offerings are making all kinds of noise. Everything is just in chaos. Jesus tells them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Now, as I already mentioned, sacrifice was a very, very important part of worship in ancient Judaism. It was a form of prayer. People came and offered their sacrifices as they were commanded to by the law that they followed. Now, when you came to offer your sacrifice, the, the sacrifice that you gave to God had to be pure. And since people traveled great distances for these festivals, for these days, they didn't live anywhere near Jerusalem sometimes. They couldn't just bring along whatever animals they might need because, oh goodness, what if a coyote grabs onto your, your dove or grab, grabs your sheep? Now it's no longer pure. So they just waited till they got to Jerusalem so that they could just buy whatever sacrifices they could afford there. The, the very poorest of the poor would buy doves. And then as you know, you have more money, you could maybe buy a young, a young calf or you might buy a sheep or whatever. But all these were then offered as fully burnt offerings to God. Now the temple vendors knew this, that people were there, that they needed these things. And what happens when there's a, a need, right? A great demand makes it possible for you to put your prices up. And it's okay because people have to do it. They, they need it, so they're going to pay whatever they need to pay. Money changers, um, now we might wonder why there's money changers in the temple. So the world operated on Roman currency, right? Everybody used coins of Rome all over the world because Rome was pretty much the world at that point. But you could not pay your temple tax and make your, your um, contribution to the temple with Roman money. That's Caesar's money. So people had to exchange it for the temple coin. And again, I don't know about you, when I travel to a foreign country, I make sure that I have the money I need. If you try to exchange it at the airport <laughs> or when you get there, you're paying a big fat fee because they know you need it <laughs> and they know they can. And it's a similar kind of thing that is happening here. Now we have to remember that Jesus is not having an issue with the temple with sacrifices or with any of that, because Jesus himself is a very devout Jew. He observed the Sabbath. He observed all the religious festivals and days. He loved God. He was faithful to God as a Jewish person in his day. So he doesn't say the temple is bad. He doesn't say sacrifices are bad. The issue that he takes here is to do with the religious authorities who allow this kind of exploitation to go on in the house of the Lord, a place that is meant for prayer and healing, that is supposed to be accessible to all, and they are just not doing that. The temple in those days was very much associated with the presence of God. People believed that this is where they encountered God. How it is run, then, by the religious authorities who they work to include or to exclude, equates it then with who God is and how God works too. So again, if we misrepresent who God is, and this is how people think God is, is that right? That's not right. That's the hypocrisy Jesus is upset about. He is challenging their exploitive practices and hypocrisy that limit access to God for others who really, really want to connect with God but simply can't always do so. Now, I tell you what, this has been a rough day for the people of Jerusalem. It's been very, very tumultuous. There's been a whole lot of upheaval already. But Jesus is not done yet. But before we go on, I'm going to tell you a quick story. So there was once this king, and he had just worked very hard to unite his kingdom. People had been 
divided, but he brought them all together. And so now he wanted to get a capital city that wasn't first one or the other so that no one could say, well, he picked our city over yours or whatever. And there was this one city, it was on a hill, it was perfect, but oh boy, would it be hard to take, right? Because it's on a hill and very well defended. And the people who lived in the city taunted down to the king and said, you know what? Bring it on. Even our blind and our lame will be able to keep you out of this city. Ha ha, you're not getting anywhere. Well, this king was smart. And he said, well, every city needs water. So he sent his soldiers up the water channel into the city to take it from within. And after he took the city, um, he remembered those taunts and he banished the blind and the lame from the house. Now this is a story about King David from 2 Samuel 5, of how he took the city of Jerusalem. And this was the house that the people who were blind and lame would be banned from, is the temple. So this is a rule that came all the way from the time of King David. But we see here in Matthew, who is it that comes to Jesus as he is teaching in the temple? It's the blind and the lame that come to him. And he welcomes them, and he heals them. Jesus is turning those old rules on their head, because they're not God's rules, they're people's rules. And those rules limit access for people, and that's not necessary. <clears throat> Everyone is welcome in this house of worship, no matter what anyone says. And not just them, but, oh goodness, children. Oh, we've talked about children in Bible times, too. We love and venerate and cherish our children in, in ancient times, children were not always really treated as well as we treat our children today. So they would definitely not have been allowed to run wild in the temple shouting Hosanna to the son of David and, and just, you know, being in God's house with wild abandon and joy. Like, I love that kind of stuff. I mean, kids can be as noisy as they want because it's their church too. But in those days, you know, that's just not how things were done. And now the religious authorities, now, they, didn't, they, were, they were upset about the tables and things, but, but they weren't going to say anything. But now, now, Jesus has crossed a line for them. They thought about all that they can stand. Because, like I said, it was one thing for him to flip over tables and chase the vendors out, okay, fine. But now this Jesus fellow is challenging their authorities. Who does he think he is? If all those people now have access into the temple, I mean, what happens to their carefully crafted hierarchies and religious and social divisions that they have worked so hard to establish? What happens to their authority? So they come to Jesus and they say, do you hear? Do you hear what these kids are saying? Do you hear them? Well, Jesus hears them just fine. And he knows that what they're really saying is make them be quiet. Soon they would challenge the source of Jesus' authority. And when they can't outsmart him and they can't trick him, they finally resort to murder by Roman authority with trumped up charges to silence him once and for all. Now Jesus was never going to be the Messiah that the world expected because we tend to misunderstand Jesus. You know, um, if you read the prophecies of old, it always talks about a, a person, the Messiah would come, and the Messiah would, would stop the chariots and break the bow and the sword and, and create this beautiful reign of peace over all the world. But in the, in the minds of the people who lived in these times, they were like, well, how do we get to peace without a war? We need to have a war first. We, this, this Messiah is going to need to bring God's armies. So that we can, you know, punish all our enemies and, and put them down, and then there will, yes, there will be all kinds of great peace. And that's not at all how Jesus came into the world. And that's just but one example of how we, as a people, misunderstand what Jesus is all about. He was not the new Messiah the world expected, but he is most definitely the Messiah that the world needed and that the world still needs. Hosanna, as I told the children, means save us, Lord. And Jesus did indeed come to save the people. And not just the people of the nation of Israel, but the entire world. Everyone would be included in this salvation that he brings. He is the son of David, the true king, the king of kings and the lord of lords. But he would never 
never sit on a human throne. That's not the kind of king that he is. And that's not the kind of kingdom that he came to bring. If you remember, when the governor Pilate says to him, well, they say you're a king. Like, where's your kingdom? Where are you from? And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. It is the reign of God in every human heart. As we all respond to the saving grace of our God, who calls us sons and daughters, beloved children, heirs of this kingdom. Jesus is the Lord of all. And yet, he did not come to be served, but to serve. God holds all the power in the entire universe. I mean, by God's words, by God's breath, all of this exists. And yet God allowed the cross, the incredible suffering of Jesus Christ, who willingly endured the shame and the pain for the sake of the very people, even the very people who put him there. Jesus is the Messiah we need. And he challenges us still today. Just as he challenged all the structures and the rulers and the rules of his day when their self-seeking, self-interested ways inhibited life for others. He challenges us to love bigger and wider than we ever thought possible, just as he did. He challenges us to lay down our own desires, our need to be served, in order to serve others, just as he did. He calls us to follow him faithfully out into the world and trust and courage to all those places where God is making space for the least of these, just as he did. Jesus challenges us to let go of our judgments and our pettiness and our tendencies to divide the world into an us versus them, because aren't we so good at that? He instead challenges us to draw an impossibly wide circle of grace where all are welcome, just as he did. Jesus challenges us to be the people who God knows we can be, who God created us to be, who love wholeheartedly, who serve humbly as we walk with Jesus to work together for God's justice and peace, for God's grace and God's mercy to reign in this world, to reign in every human heart. Now, as the Apostle Paul wrote so beautifully in the letter to the church of Philippi, the one that the reading that Marcia shared this morning, and that is one of my favorite, it's called the Christ hymn, it's so beautiful. It's one of my favorite passages in the, in the whole book of Philippians. But the Apostle reminds us to let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Jesus is God, and yet he chose to empty himself, to take on our human life, humbling himself so that we may know God, so that we may know God's love, so that we may know who we are to be because of who he is. He sacrificed everything in order to give us everything. Jesus is the Messiah we need because he knows what it is like to be us. Because he lived our life. And as he lived our life, he felt all the things that we feel. He experienced the things that challenge us in this life. Losing loved ones, going hungry, worrying about where your next meal is coming from, a place to stay, seeing the heartbreak and hurt of the people around him, people who are struggling and suffering and still, you know, still holding out hope for God. He saw all that. He shared in our joys, too. The joys of watching babies be born and making new friends and successes great and small in our lives. All the blessings that we just you know, we count up all these myriad experiences into this great big mixing mountain pot that is our life, and Jesus lived it. He knows what it's like to be us. He died our death. He rose again. All those things are amazing. And because he lives, we 
will live forevermore in him. He gets us, even if we don't always get him. We cannot celebrate those joyful hosannas, those shouts of save us, without the one who comes in the name of the Lord, at whose name every knee should bend and every tongue confess that he is Lord, our Lord, our Savior. And we cannot get to Easter without the cross. It is on that cruel piece of wood on a hill outside the city of Jerusalem just days later that our Messiah would pour out his life for each of us. This is love. Incredible love. Indescribable, incomprehensible, radical love. God's love. For you, for me, for all. We cannot, we can't experience a love like this in our life and not be changed by it, can we? Oh my goodness, I don't know. It just leaves me floored, doesn't it? If you really sit with that and you think of what that all means, doesn't it just strike you speechless? Where we stand there, we just go, wow, I am that love. It changes us forever. So thank you, God, for the gift of your son, the Messiah we need. Amen. Friends, we are now going to share in the Holy Communion, and I want to um, remind you that this is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who, who ordained for us to remember him through the sacrament, and this table is open to all. That invitation is issued by Jesus Christ to all who will come to this table, so you do not have to be a member of this church. You do not be, have to be a member of the United Methodist Church in order to participate in communion here. So I invite all of you, if you want to come to this table, it is open to you, and you are welcome here. Um, please open your hymnals to page 12, and join me as we participate in our communion with me. Christ our Lord invites to his table all those who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Let us draw near in faith and confess our sin before God and one another as we pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so, friends, I want you to hear this good news, that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and this proves God's unfailing and steadfast love for each and every one of us. So in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In love you made us for yourself. And when we fell short of your grace over and again, your love remained <coughs> steadfast. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Easter feast. That renewed by your word and sacraments and fervent prayer and works of justice and mercy, we may come to the fullness of grace that you have prepared for those who love you. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed
Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to redeem the world. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in our likeness. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and death and offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now, when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted in grace to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Jesus Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. So friends, um, as you uh, prepare to come and participate in the sacrament of communion, the ushers will indicate to you when it's your turn to come up you will receive your bread, so I invite you to hold your hands out so I can place the bread into your hand. Um, and then you will take a cup, and you can place your empty cup into the container that is um, off to the side on the table. Um, we do have gluten-free communion wafers. They will be on a separate tray on the little table, which I'm not touching because I'm passing out the bread to all of you. So if you need to use the gluten-free wafers, please help yourself to a gluten-free wafer from the special plate kept separate from the bread. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I now invite you to stand in body or in spirit as we sing our closing hymn number 617, I Come With Lord. Securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. Neath his wings.
securely hide you. Daily manna still provide you. God be with you till we meet.